The Vocaster is Focusrite's entry into podcasting and streaming interfaces. It has been out for a while now and I think it's finally time to have a look at it. Hey, Julian Kraus here and today I'm going to have a look at the Focusrite Vocaster 2. This interface has been sent to me by a viewer and supporter, the legendary Rainer Richter. Huge thanks Rainer, sending over this interface makes this whole review possible. Highly appreciate it. Big shout out also to all my patrons which support my gear acquisitions and I mean my reviews. Alright, let's jump right in. On top of the Vocaster you got a lot of controls which makes it quite easy to adjust the majority of functions. You got two separate dials which control the headphone volume and the left one simultaneously acts as a volume dial for the main output. In the middle you got an encoder knob which is used to set the gain for both mic inputs. Which input you're controlling you can choose with the two buttons and there are additional buttons which quickly let you toggle on and off the integrated processing and a mute button for each channel. I really like the inclusion of the mute button, especially in live streaming situations, this can be quite handy to have. Around the encoder knob there's a little level meter, which looks quite nice, but they are not too terribly precise. For a quick and rough level check they work totally fine though. On the front of the interface you can find the aforementioned two quarter inch headphone outputs. And let's also have a look at the back here. Starting on the left you get a power button, which you might know I'm a really big fan of. It's just so convenient to easily turn on and off the interface. So big thumbs up from me. Of course you also get a USB-C connection to hook up the interface to your PC. And then there's a 3.5mm output, which Focusrite has labeled as a camera output. And the intention behind it is that you have an additional output that you can route directly to a camera. Who would have thought? Besides that you also get two quarter inch balanced main outputs. And on the far right you get two proper XLR inputs. You get one more in and output, which is a 3.5mm TRRS connection which you can use to connect a phone and send audio to it or receive audio from it. For connectivity, the Vocaster also supports Bluetooth, so you can easily hook up an external Bluetooth device. And there's one more button to toggle on and off phantom power for the two channels, and that can actually be done individually, and also done in the software, which we'll have a look at later. One thing you might have noticed is that there is no TRS line level or instrument connection. So this directly shows you that the Vocaster is primarily designed to be used with microphones plugged in. As mentioned, you have an additional unbalanced input where you can route in consumer line levels, but other than that, there is no easy way to connect professional outboard gear. Again, this is by design because you should not need any outboard gear, as there are some real-time audio effects built into this interface, which I will go over a little later in this video. In terms of build quality, the Vocaster 2 is nothing special. It is completely out of plastic, but it is quite dense plastic and the knobs turn very smoothly. The middle encoder knob is even out of metal and feels high quality. No real complaints from my side. If you know me, then you know that I'm always curious to have a look inside the device, and of course I couldn't restrain myself to take the Vocaster apart. For digital to analog and analog to digital conversion, the Vocaster uses a 2 Cirrus Logic CS4272, which is a ubiquitous converter that you can also find on the Scarlet series. I think I say this every time, but the converter gets a bit old at this point, and for the price point I would have liked to see an upgraded conversion. Then again, when the CS4272 is implemented properly, it does offer a very good audio quality, and we'll find out about that in a minute. One small little easter egg I found inside the Vocaster was on the top. There's a complete list of people who worked on this product, which I thought was a nice touch. Okay, let's hop over to the sound quality and have a look at the microphone input first. This is the frequency response of the mic input and this should of course be as flat as possible to not color the sound. As you can see, there's a slight bit of roll off at the lower frequencies at the maximum gain setting of the interface. This is something that is very common and the roll off here is quite mild and I wouldn't say that this is very much audible. Then again, I would have liked to see a completely flat frequency response from an interface in this price range. One more thing you can see is that in the high frequencies, as soon as we get above the human hearing range, the level drops off sharply and this is because the Vocast is actually only running with a sample rate of 48kHz. To be honest, for podcasting and live streaming, 48kHz is absolutely fine and pretty much all you need. No complaints here. With the gain turned down slightly, which you would normally use the interface with a condenser microphone, the frequency response becomes much more flat, and now the response looks very nice in the audible range. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but here you can see the distortion measurement for the mic input, and as you can see the distortion just shoots up a minuscule amount ever so slightly before clipping. But this is so low that you wouldn't hear this, 
So that's a pretty good performance and in my opinion you don't really have to worry about distortions on the mic input. The dynamic range is the ratio of the loudest signal that the interface can capture and its noise floor and you want this to be as high as possible to have the least amount of noise. In terms of dynamic range the Vocaster performs quite similarly to the Scarlett series of audio interfaces and that shouldn't come as a surprise as they both use the same converter chip. The Vocaster just achieves about 1 or 2 decibel better performance here. 112 dB on the mic input is already quite good, definitely not state of the art but more than enough for podcasting and voice recordings. And now the test you've all been waiting for, the preamp noise test. I'm speaking into a Shure SM7B which is a very low sensitive dynamic microphone which really stresses the preamps and this is directly connected to the interface. To give you a feeling of how the noise sounds like I'll be quiet for a second. And here one more time a little bit amplified against other interfaces. You shouldn't be surprised that the performance of the Vocaster is very similar to the Focusrite Scarlett series, coming in with a preamp noise of around minus 129 dBU. That's really good and you could hear that in the audio test. That also means that you can use dynamic microphones and still get very low noise recordings, which is essential for podcasting. One more thing to mention is that the Vocaster has a really nice amount of gain. So that means that you can easily amplify even low sensitive dynamic microphones like the SM7B without any problems. Because the preamp noise is so low and the interface does have a nice amount of gain, there's really no need for a cloud header or fat lifter. I will spare you the details of the aux input because it is virtually identical to the mic input. I'll just quickly flip through the graphs here and here you can see the frequency response. Distortion performance and dynamic range is exactly at the level you would expect for this device. No complaints here. Ok, let's hop over to the output side and first check out the main output on the back. Its frequency response is as flat as it can be in the audible range and that's an excellent response and exactly what you want to see. No further comment needed. In terms of distortion you can see that with an increasing level the distortion components settle in at around minus 100 dB which is completely inaudible for all intents and purposes. In terms of dynamic range the output looks pretty good with 108 dBA weighted. Again definitely not state of the art performance but totally usable. While we're on the topic of outputs let's have a quick look at the camera output. Its frequency response is super flat as well but I had a bit of an interference showing up in the noise measurement. Look at all these barest tones here rising through the noise floor. I did a test with the output connected to a camera and to be honest I could not hear this interference. So this does not really seem to be an audible problem. Not sure if other vocasters show the same behavior or it's just mine. Because of the low output volume and the sparrow's tones, the dynamic range only came in at a measly 66 decibels. Running this signal into a camera might still be totally fine though, as the 3.5mm input performance on many cameras isn't the best to begin with, and there's a good chance that the camera output still outperforms the camera's input. Like I said in my quick check, the audio routed into a camera sounded fine. Ok, time for the headphone output performance. As always, you can see a plethora of measurements here, and you can compare them to other interfaces. I'm not going to go into all of them, but I'm going to have a look at the most important ones here. The first thing to highlight is that the frequency response of the headphone output is really quite remarkable. There's a tiny bit of roll off in the lower frequencies, but that's completely inaudible and in my opinion the frequency response is really quite nice. The output impedance is definitely a bit higher than on the Scarlett series, and that means that there is the possibility that with very low impedance headphones, the interface might just ever so slightly color the sound. But to be honest, 4 ohms is still low enough that with the majority of headphones there's really no issue here. So I guess it's fine. The power output is ok, although really not that high. Low impedance headphones can be driven quite easily with the Vocaster, but if you have very high impedance headphones, that's when the interface tends to struggle. In terms of distortion, it's nice to see that the Vocaster performs better than the Scarlett series, though that does not mean much because the Scarlett series does have quite a bit of distortion. With the low impedance headphones, the Vocaster does show a slight elevated distortion profile. While this isn't the best performance, this is already at a level where it's not directly apparent. If you use high impedance headphones, the distortion drops significantly, and then you really do not have to worry about distortion anymore. Noise performance is fine if you use very sensitive in-ear monitors, 
then there's still a good chance that you might perceive some background noise. But with the majority of headphones you shouldn't hear any noise from this output. The channel balance was really quite nice on my unit and the left and the right side were always equally loud. And the crosstalk figure is pretty average, but I would say that this does not pose any audible problem. So don't worry about it. Okay, let's have a look at the software. As you can see it is relatively simplistic compared to some other interfaces and that can be a good or a bad thing. On the plus side, it's really not too complicated to get the vocaster to do what you want it to do. On the top left you get your controls for the first microphone input, which Focusrite calls the host. Here you can set your gain, have a look at your level meter and also have access to the functions like mute, auto gain and the audio effects. Exactly the same goes for the second mic input, that's what you can find under guest on the right side. I have tested the auto gain feature and there the interface makes a short recording of your voice and then sets the level accordingly. I found the final level to be roughly around minus 23 dBFS, which is a tad lower than I would personally set it, but it does provide you a nice amount of headroom and when the processing is turned on the sound shouldn't be too quiet. At the bottom you have your mixing controls and here you have full control over how much of each channel you send to your output and record. What's quite nice to see is that you also have the possibility to include a loopback, which can be quite helpful in situations where you want to include your computer's audio. In the enhanced dropdown you can find four integrated audio processing presets. Clean, warm, bright and radio. While explaining what these presets do I will toggle between them in the background and you can see in the top left corner which one I've currently activated. In general all these enhanced features are a combination of an EQ and a compressor. For the clean, warm and bright effects the compression is identical, only the radio setting differs slightly in its curve. All of the effects have the same amount of makeup gain applied, so when you turn on the effects the audio will get about 5 decibels louder. When the audio level goes roughly above minus 20 dBFS the compression sets in with a ratio of about 4 to 1. Where the effects differ the most is in their EQ setting. The clean setting has two noticeable bumps around 2K and 8K and a small notch around 120Hz. Additionally there's a high pass filter applied at around 80Hz. To be honest I would not really call this clean, this is already a pretty aggressive EQ curve which slightly lowers the bass and increases the treble. But it can definitely help to bring a bit more clarity, especially when you're using more muffled microphones like the SM7B. The warm setting is quite interesting, it has a pretty significant bump around 450Hz and a slight notch at around 2.5kHz. I usually connect a warm sound with slightly elevated bass, but the peak at around 450Hz is quite aggressive. You decide if that sounds warmer to you. The bright setting has two noticeable peaks around 2K and 10K, which lift the treble quite significantly. And that in combination with the 500Hz dip, this definitely results in what you would call a brighter sound. Last but not least, here you can see the curve for the radio preset. And to be honest, I'm not surprised. This is very typical and what you would call a V-shaped response for obvious reasons. With the radio curve you have a boost in treble, slightly recessed mids and a big boost in bass again. This results in what many people would describe as the radio sound. All in all I think the presets do roughly what their name implies. My only gripe is that the presets are a bit overcooked and I would have really liked to have at least one more preset that would have been more gentle. For example a clean preset with just a high pass filter to reduce rumble and some gentle compression. If you turn on the integrated effects of the vocaster you will definitely hear the effect on the audio and I would not describe the presets as gentle. On the plus side they do process your audio straight away in an audible way, but on the flip side you do not have any further control over the presets, so in that regard the processing is a bit limited. The effect and the whole mixing are done digitally and that always means that there is some amount of delay. I measured it and I'm happy to report that the monitoring latency is only 0.6 milliseconds and this is completely inaudible. This time stays the same even with audio processing enabled, which is great to see. So I would agree that the mixing and audio processing in the vocaster is done in real time. The round trip latency for this interface is probably less important because you're likely going to use the built in effects and you're not running your audio into your computer and then back out again, like for example in an Ampson. Nonetheless, here are the times I measured with 48 kHz. Let's wrap this up. Who is this interface for and who should look somewhere else? If you need an interface that connects to outboard gear and you directly want to connect an instrument, this is not the interface for you. 
the Volcaster is simply not designed for that. I would also say that if you're someone who really wants precise control over audio mixes, create multiple mixes and precisely dial in the audio effects, you will likely not be happy with the Vocaster. But if you're recording a podcast or you're in the live streaming situations where you want some basic processing done to your audio, this is where the Vocaster becomes quite interesting. Who would have thought a device called Vocaster is designed for podcasting? If you're looking for an interface that has low noise preamps, two headphone outputs, basic audio processing and mixing is generally easy to use and even has additional connections for camera and smartphone, the Vocaster 2 might just be the interface for you. If this review was helpful to you, please leave a like, subscribe for more and I will see you all in the next one.